this is relevant to this. And we will catch you after the news. I hope you find a little good news in there today. Live from NPR News in Culver City, California, I'm Janine Herbst. In the Florida Panhandle, crews are having problems getting into hard-hit areas. Cell phone service is out, thousands are without power, and that could be weeks before it's restored. Rescue crews are sifting through debris, hoping to find people still not accounted for. Entire blocks of homes have been leveled in Mexico Beach and Panama City, where resident Brian Hartman says he's overwhelmed by the storm's aftermath. The community's coming together, outside people are coming in to help, so I'm hoping we can get back to normal in some form here soon, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. And Florida Senator Bill Nelson says that Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida was destroyed, but he's promising the base will be rebuilt. He visited the base today. In North Carolina, authorities in the city of Greensboro say flooding from Michael caused more than one million gallons of untreated wastewater to overflow from its facilities, but say that the areas have been inspected and cleaned up where necessary. A federal judge in Boston tomorrow will hear opening statements in a lawsuit alleging Harvard University discriminates against Asian applicants. In Boston today, the sides held opposing rallies. From member station WBUR, Simone Rios has more. In defense of Harvard, protester Bin Zhang says the school is rectifying past and present inequalities. It's the responsibility of the society to take care of some of the disadvantaged people, historically disadvantaged people. Right? Across town, Helen Huang said admissions officers should give preference to no race. No matter white, black, Hispanic, Asian, our Asian, we are working hard, study hard. We support our children to get good education. Advocates for the suit say they want to stop Harvard from considering race in its admissions process. Opponents say the suit is an attack on diversity itself. For NPR News, I'm Simon Rios in Boston. President Trump says he's not ruling out resurrecting his administration's family separation policy at the U.S.-Mexico border. Trump says separating migrant parents and children would deter undocumented people from trying to get into the country. But Republican Senator Jeff Flake says the policy shouldn't be resumed. We shouldn't bring that policy back. Uh, that, that, uh, that simply is un-American, and I think uh, everybody recognized that. Speaking there on ABC's This Week. Meanwhile, a group of more than 1,000 migrants has taken off from Honduras this weekend, walking to the U.S. to seek refugee status. In Istanbul, a truck accident today left at least 22 migrants, including children, dead. Thirteen people were injured. Turkey's official news agency says they were traveling in a truck when it rolled off a bridge. The driver says he was cut off by another vehicle. Turkey is the main draw for migrants who set out by sea for neighboring Greece because that country is a member of the EU. This is NPR News. Moody's has upgraded Portugal's credit rating from junk to investment grade. That's the last leading rating agency to do so, putting the country back in investment-ready territory for the first time since 2011 when it was forced into a bailout that entailed painful austerity. Moody says it's upgraded Portugal's debt by one notch, setting a downward trend in public debt and more robust finances, generally that should help the country absorb economic shocks. Moody says there is little prospect of that country uh, landing back in the junk basket anytime soon. The heir to a brewing dynasty has died at the age of 102. Bill Coors was a former chairman of the company that bears his name and the grandson of its founder. He was also one of the taste testers for the brewery. NPR's Colin Dwyer has more. Next time you crack open a cold one, you can thank Bill Coors. You can also thank him when you finish and toss in the recycling. That's because the longtime beer executive pioneered the use of the recyclable aluminum can. For the first time in history... Aluminum ingot has been converted into a finished beer can. That's Coors himself, narrating an old video on the process. During more than six decades with the family business, he helped turn it into an industry power. But his ultra-conservative politics also attracted significant controversy, even boycotts from union leaders and people of color. Molson Coors says he died peacefully at his home in Colorado. Colin Dwyer, NPR News. And I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Culver City, California. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio. 
broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back. You are listening to Fate Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I appreciate so much you being here. I am fortunate. I have a friend and a paranormal experiencer who went through a really severe extreme haunting, came through the other side, and has gone on to live a beautiful and blessed life and is just a great person. His name is Chris DeSegere, and I hope that you'll join me in welcoming him. Welcome back, Chris. Still love being here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love any chance we have to speak to each other. I I enjoy your friendship. Ditto. And thank you. And you know, we were we were talking about following an extreme haunting such as this, and yeah, you know, sometimes it's in the back of your mind. You're cautious with your environment and you're attentive. But when you came through this. I don't want to close out and move on to something else without letting people know how you managed to do the closure on your experience, I guess is a way to put it. What happened to to help get through this? You know, you had Jeff doing documentation and you had the support. And I know at one point your dad had come to the school to protect you and let you have a good night's sleep, especially because you weren't getting any. Right. And which by the way, your dad is one of my heroes, just so you know that. Going to just put that out there. He's amazing. He really he is, is amazing. And he just won another medal recently, didn't he? I think he won 4. <laughs> <laughs> See, astounding man. It might be four, but I think it's five for the senior game. He's a nationally ranked uh, sprinter for Masters uh, 7 and over. He goes to he runs in Colorado and New Hampshire and all over the world. And he's just he's an amazing role model. He's an amazingly talented person, and I'm so lucky to have him as my dad. You know, it's again, it's a you roll the dice and you're born and you don't know what's going to happen. And I lucked out in that one. There you did. I think so too. But you know, he came and he was taking care of you. Jeff was helping take care of you. And how did you gain closure? What did y'all do to come through this? Isn't that a funny thing? I, and I think you put it succinctly. My dad came up to take care of me. Jeff was taking care of me. Beth and, and Linda and Judy were taking care of me. It's amazing how people invested themselves in my well-being. You know, people talk about the idea of the ghost boy. There'd be no ghost boy without people caring for me, finding some value in me, whatever that is, and I'll never know, and then supporting me in ways to be healthy and surviving, moving forward, and finally sharing. You know, um, my father, when he, when he came to visit up at the college, I had called him and said, listen, Dad, I don't know what this is, but it's real. I can't do much more of this. You know, and he just dropped everything and he drove right up and uh, he brought with him a, a hit a baseball bat. He had a holy water filled cross. He had a he, had a, he put his pistol with him. He was ready for everything. You know, he didn't know what was going on. If it was a gang thing or a drug thing or who knows what it was, fraternity stuff, uh, made dementia. But, you know, he, he spent the night and I finally slept. I felt so safe. I had my dad there. It was kind of cool, even though I was, I was, you know, taller than by then, you know, but just having my father made me feel like grounded. And uh, in the morning he said, listen change your room, get out of here. So, so that's how I knew that um, even someone as him who was so successful, intelligent, and grounded, him saying that, I realized something was going on. So, And I always appreciate him taking the time because he cared about me uh, to do that. And I, I hope that I'm a good enough father to do the same thing for my children if it happens to them. But um, in any event, in terms of moving from survival mode into forget or put in the box mode to eventually sharing mode took a long time. And, and just like, just like the first few things that, that I experienced, it's all about friendship. It's all about kindness. It's all about belief in, in one's friends and, and they and you. Um, 
the the desire to the decision to actually share to finally share it publicly was something that I was kind of um, encouraged to do. I was encouraged to do this by people that I I met over time. Uh, early on, Jeff had said, you know, there needs to be a way you can share this somehow, and we looked for those ways. We weren't quite sure, and time passed, and a friend named Alan Lewis said he should we should do something like this, and then time passed, and we're having a hard time. And finally, it, 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 two people, uh, one gentleman's name is Bill Edwards, the other individual is Mara Katria, and those two individuals, um, their talents, their skills uh, were such that they're able to help me find a way to share. They both believe that it should be done in a positive way, not a negative way. They both believe that the people in the haunting should be respected and not just be used for profit. They both agree that the identity of the ghost is less important to focus on than the impact of the ghost. And all these things they said to me, I thought, this feels right. And so, uh, you know, please talk with me was a project that uh, Bill Edwards produced and Mark Katria directed. She won an award for it, actually, Best Director. And uh, it was basically a, a docu-thriller, a docu-horror of a day-by-day -day sequence of the haunting itself. And they used Jeff's notes and the photographs, and they began to recreate the moments. And I was nervous about the process, but it was amazing to see things come to fruition. And then to promote the film and see people thought about that, we began to go to colleges. And uh, I spoke at Geneseo. That was where I met Tim Shaw, who wrote the first book on The Haunting. I spoke at colleges local to me, and we spoke at Penn State University. And uh, while speaking at Penn State, there were folks in the audience who had been on different TV shows, on, on A&E and different channels. And uh, one of them said to me, listen, you know, we're going to get you on TV. I thought, well, thanks. Have a good day. People just say things all the time. You know how it is. And uh, about two weeks later, NBC called. They own Sci-Fi. And so we want to make a TV show. And the guy who did Survivor, Mark Burnett, wants to do this thing. And how about this date? I'm like, <gasps> it, was, it was an amazing thing. So uh, I was scared because I knew I knew Mara now. I knew Bill now. They became my friends and good friends. And they were creative. And they were they cared about me. It's different when you have this huge network with these writers in California and these directors in New York and these camera people and people playing you and – all of a sudden, the comfort zone was taken from me. And so what happened was Sci-Fi said to uh, Bill and Tamara and the rest of the, the casting crew, please talk with me, put that on hold. We want first dibs on this. In exchange, we'll get this on Sci-Fi. It'll become like a nationally known thing, and then you can use that to help promote your film. And so that was basically a quid pro quo kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? So both sides agreed to put PTWM, our docu-thriller, on hold and then go with the Sci-Fi. And even though I and Jeff and Beth and my father and everybody else, Craig, told them and wrote them what had happened step by step, and I shared with them our notes and everything, they still write things. They still create. Every reality show you see is scripted, every single one. And, and over the course of filming, and they were nice to me. They gave us $50 for meal money. They put us in this gorgeous hotel with gold over the place. I met cool people from television. That was nice being in Manhattan, but – they had these changes to the script, to my experience, that weren't weren't correct. Oh there, are there were thirteen. I mean, there were thirteen things I said. That's not true. That's not true. That's wrong. That's true. Because they wanted to create a narrative. And one of the things they have is they have sponsors. And let's say a certain sponsor, they're going to give two hundred thousand dollars. They want this demographic shown. Or a certain sponsor wants this product shown. So what the scriptwriters do is they take the events as they're told. Then they incorporate demographic information and data and sponsor desires into the product. So it becomes an amalgam of truth and advertising. Ironic, truth and advertising. Anyway, but that's what happened. And so I'll give you an example. Mercedes-Benz was one of the sponsors, primary sponsors of the, of the sci-fi show. They invested a lot of money in this. And demographic-wise, it's usually older white men who are married who drive that kind of car. And so they wanted in this, this haunting to have an older, like a father figure, a gentleman who's that's my dad. So the sci-fi uh, channel wanted my father to be there because he added to that demographic and was there. You know, if it was, if it was a different type of demographic, he wouldn't might be in the show at all. One of my friends, Craig Norris, he flew down from up near Canada and he, he, he recorded they had a person to be him who wasn't included didn't for the demographics. That's how it works. Anyway, so I had a problem with what they were saying. 
And at one point in time, I said, I'm not saying these things. And so the gentleman said, he said, um, look, it, you're the expert on the haunting. 